Good afternoon and morning, everyone, wherever you are in the world. I'm Ivan Williams, and I'll be your moderator for the next hour and a half. Uh, before we proceed to the panel discussion, please bear in mind some really quick housekeeping aspects. Interpretation for this session will be available, as you might know, in 12 languages, including Bangla, Basa, Hindi, Japanese, Korean, Malay, Mandarin, Sinhalese, Tamil, Thai, and Vietnamese, while the main language of communication, as you've probably noticed, will be English. If you haven't registered to the United Nations uh, Responsible Business and Human Rights Forum Asia Pacific uh, yet, uh, you still have time to do it. So remember that uh, the formal forum will take place from the 1st uh, till the 4th of June. Uh, we invite you uh, to actively engage and direct questions to the participants to the WhatsApp uh, Q&A function provided by the conference platform to ask questions from the speakers. At the end of the session, we will have uh, 10 to 15 minutes available for the Q&A session. Today is the allocated day for site sessions. A total of seven sessions are taking place, so please feel free to actively participate. And finally, thanks uh, to the organizers for this opportunity given to Ayush to host this session. And special thanks to Dr. Harpreet Kaur and Suparet Wasarat, the team and the team behind, uh, also the technical facilitators. Today's session is hosted by the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health. And the title of the session is Achieving Decent World for All through the lens of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. It is now my absolute pleasure to introduce the audience to this excellent panel of guest speakers. So I'll be asking our speakers to briefly introduce themselves and the work the organization uh, does. So our first speaker is Tarini uh, Suraburan, and she, she's a business and human rights specialist at the UNDP Business and Human Rights in, in Asia. And um, Tarini, can you tell us a bit more about your role and the work your organization does? Thank you. Thank you so much, Ivan, for having me today. And uh, greeting from Bangkok. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tarini. I am the Business and Human Rights Specialist at UNDP Thailand. In this project, we have been supporting the implementations of the UN Guiding Principle on Business and Human Rights, or UNGP, which is now the most authoritative global framework guiding the responsibilities and roles of the state and the private sector on respect and protect human rights of others, and also to ensure the access to remedy for those who harm with the business activities. In addition, we are also working closely with the Royal Thai government on the implementations of the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights, or the NAP, which Thailand is the first country um, having the adoption of the standalone NAP um, in the last two years. So um, again, thank you so much um, for the invitation today to give the opportunity to UNDP Thailand to be part of this interesting uh, discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Tarini. It will be great to have your um, regional insights uh, for the session. Um, our next speaker is Francis Kim uh, Upi. Uh, he's um, a director of economic and social policy at the International Trade Union uh, Confederation Asia Pacific. Hi, Francis. And thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to join this interesting session. My name is Francis Kim. I'm the director of uh, economic and social policy of the International Trade Union Confederation Asia Pacific. We are uh, opening arm of the International Trade Union Confederation Global, and we are effectively representing 60 million workers in 59 national trade union centers from 34 countries and territories in the in the Asian and Pacific region. The ITUCAP works for economic and social political justice by realizing decent work, which is persistently in serious deficit in our region. Our work also includes campaigning for a fair trading system and democratic economic integration to ensure inclusive and sustainable development. Again, I'm very glad to join you with a brilliant panel, uh, and I'm looking forward to have, having a uh, meaningful discussion today. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Francis. We're really delighted to, to have you 
Um, next speaker is Natasha um, Mahendran. Uh, she's a social and human rights project manager at the Earthworm uh, Foundation, and she's based in Malaysia. Hello, everybody. Very nice to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, I currently lead Earthworm Foundation's labor and human rights work in Malaysia. Earthworm Foundation is a member-based nonprofit that supports company members and clients to improve social and environmental practices across their commodity supply chains around the world. In Malaysia, our work mainly focuses on the palm oil industry, as well as some others such as pulp and paper and rubber. My work specifically focuses on business and supplier engagement for the prevention of forced labor, uh, raising awareness on child labor, and promoting ethical recruitment of migrant workers. Wonderful to be here with you all. Thanks, Natasha. And last but, but not least is uh, Thomas Wills, um, or Tom Wills. And he's a project manager and corporate accountability and trade at the Business and Human Rights uh, Resource Center in the, in, in the UK. I'm really grateful that you're joining us really early in the morning and on a bank holiday. Hi, yeah, Tom. Thank you, Ivan. Um, it's lovely to be here uh, and, um, and to contribute to this panel. So um, I work at the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, which is a global human rights NGO with staff in more than 20 countries around the world. And our function is to advance human rights in business and to eradicate corporate abuse. And we do this by tracking allegations of corporate human rights abuses via our website. And then we use this rich information and analysis to support rights groups as they build a case for better business practices and for better laws to stop corporate abuse and address the imbalance of power between corporations and their workers and communities. As part of this work, we are looking at the role that international trade agreements and investment agreements play in creating and sustaining corporate power and we're also thinking critically about how trade deals can be used to support businesses to bring greater commitment and action on human and labor rights. And this obviously includes a focus on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Um, and so I'm looking forward to contrib my, contributing my thoughts to this discussion today. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. It is great to have your uh, trade related expertise um, today. So, well, thanks everyone again. Um, and before we dive uh, into the conversations, um, I'd like to give you a little information of who um, IOSH um, is and what IOSH uh, does. So the, the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health um, is the world's leading chartered professional body for people responsible for safety, health, and well-being in the workplace. Um, our focus is to support our members in their efforts um, to create workplaces that are safer, healthier, and more sustainable for everyone. Um, as well as being a professional body and membership organization, we also a thought leader, um, helping organizations around the world excel in safety and health. We also develop uh, products and services to enable um, employers to create the right leadership, culture, and governance in order to deliver a tangible business benefit in relation to productivity, competitiveness, brand, and resilience. As you can see from this slide, we, we have all, um, well over 48,000 um, members in 130 countries, and we act as a champion advisor, advocate, and trainer for safety and health professionals working in organizations of all size in most sectors. And we also have uh, more than uh, 40 branches um, organizing meetings and activities helping to support members with professional development, learning and professional networking opportunities. Um, myself, I belong to the policy and regulatory and engagement team. And from a policy perspective, IOSH influences decision makers and informs uh, the policy making process in many aspects of safety, health and well-being at work. More recently, uh, we are engaging in conversations uh, to better understand how health and safety interplays with different aspects of either social sustainability, business and human rights, um, corporate governance, and decent work as well. Um, these are just uh, some examples of our re recent engagement with public policy 
um, in the region, either through uh, public consultations or calls um, for evidence from governments or from policy development initiatives where we highlight the need uh, to create safer, healthier and more sustainable workplaces. And as you uh, can see, our influence is also um, evidence-based uh, and, and supported by research and carried out in the, um, in the region. So these are just um, some examples of um, research that we carried out um, to better understand uh, the complexities of those working, um, as you can see, in challenging um, sectors, um, such as those operating in the global uh, container uh, ports industry, in the maritime industry, seafarers, or those working um, in the coal mine industry. And on this particular subject, we also strive um, to advocate for self, safer, healthier, and more sustainable uh, trade by elevating um, occupational safety and health standards um, in trade policy and agreements. So, um, our recent contribution to the United Nations uh, Policy Hackathon, uh, we recommended that um, general elements of trade agreements need to better embed um, a minimum uh, level of occupational safety and health um, regulations. And I think that this is a message that is worth uh, resonating um, in similar platforms like this one, or the ones that will be led um, in the next few months by uh, the ILO, the International Labor Organization, or the WTO, uh, the World Trade Organization. And without any further ado, let, let's give it a start um, to the conversation. And it's worth noting that this session uh, has an exploratory remit. Um, so while the um, Economic Partnership um, Agreement um, has long um, been long in the regional and Asia Pacific agenda, uh, the implementation of the free trade agreements is still in its infancy. A uh, reason why we thought this could be a great time to discuss about this particular issue. And you might already be aware that many of the countries uh, involved in this agreement are currently in the process of formal uh, ratification. So it is expected that this process will extend till uh, January uh, 2022. And I'm conscious that we do have a subject matter expert in this session, but I just wanted to uh, give a quick snapshot of the economic uh, um, significance um, of the RECEP um, agreement for the region. And in summary, this is a free trade agreement that looks to stimulate um, markets and enable, enable uh, the free movement of uh, goods, um, especially industrial and agricultural uh, products. Um, I forgot to mention that we have divided this session into four different uh, themes. So the first theme uh, looks at providing a better understanding of the agreement in itself. Um, so with that in mind, um, Tarini, uh, Tom, I'd like to know your initial thoughts on what are the benefits expected from the RC and EP across uh, global supply chains and how the partnership um, can support or better support the promotion of human rights and global supply chain uh, in the region. So, Tarini, if you, if you want to start the discussion, thank you. Thank you, Ivan, for, for this question. And this question is very important. And to understand um, uh, the answer for this question, I think it's very important to understand the holistic impact of this trade agreement. In the past, we have seen um, several bilateral and multilateral trade agreement made in our regions. And the ASEP agreement, uh, which was signed in 2020, therefore builds on these foundations. And the objective of the ASEP agreement is to create uh, the economic partnership uh, that will facilitate the expansions of the regional trade and investment, therefore will contribute to the economic growth and also development. Literally, if this agreement is um, successfully translated into practice, it will bring about more job creations for people and also the market opportunities for the private sector in the regions. 
So this um, is the impact that we expect to see from having such a trade agreement. However, we have to make um, a very careful uh, interpretations of its impact as it might come together with costs and risks. The reason why I'm saying this because in the past we have seen that um, a rapid economic growth has some linkages with the environmental and social challenges relating to, for instance, um, the labor um, exploitations, the environmental degradations which have a long-term implications on human rights or the well-being and the livelihood of the community who reside uh, around the business operations. This means that if we're focusing only the economic impacts um, or benefits from having such agreement, we might have to suffer from this um, adverse impact as a consequence of human rights violations. And these situations is even now exacerbated by the context of um, COVID pandemic, where a greater risk on the human rights violations uh, is put among um, workers, especially those um, uh, who have the vulnerable status like migrant workers, workers in formal sectors, women and children, is expected to increase in this period of time. And at the moment, um, it's not clear yet if the ASEP agreement have made any um, specific provisions or the commitment to the internationally recognized standard on labor and environment. However, uh, we have seen a strong push to uh, recommendations from civil society and also other group of stakeholders, including um, investors and shareholders, um, who are call calling for a strong commitment from the government and also the role of private sector on responsible business conduct. So we can expect to see a more stringent provisions in other trade agreements in the future. One of the examples is um, on the EU trading agreement, which most um, agreement um, that they made recently with, with the trading partner uh, include the commitment on social and environmental accountability as a precondition for the negotiation with them. Therefore, to be ready for this trend, I think it's um, an opportunity for the government to strengthen and uphold the commitment and also upgrading uh, the protection measures in relation to these issues. In addition to the state, I think the role um, and responsibility of private sector is also need to be mentioned. Their role on uh, res respect human rights to meet the expectations of the UN guiding principle on this and human rights is very important. And some trading negotiations like the one made by EU also make a strong reference to these guiding principles. In Thailand, the government have made a firm commitment on the UN guiding principle on business and human rights, and the country have translated this commitment into action through the adoptions of the first uh, national action plan on business and human rights. This means that all Thai companies have a duty to respect human rights of others throughout their value chains. And to undertake this commitment and responsibility, the company are recommended to undertake the process called human rights due diligence to identify, prevent, and mitigate uh, potential and actual human rights risks that the company, uh, even uh, uh, the activity in supply chain may cause or contribute to. And therefore, this will help to promote and protect labor rights of worker in the company-owned operations and also supply chains. I think that's pretty much for my answer um, for, for the first allocation. Thank you. Th thanks, Tarini and, and Dermot. And, and it would be great to have your initial um, thoughts. And also, if, if you could build on what Tarini has said in terms of both positive and negative um, aspects uh, coming from this kind of agreements. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ivan. And um, that was a really comprehensive introduction, Tarani. Um I think my perspective is less positive on the potential impact of the RCEP. So the first thing to say is that it's certainly a big agreement and it covers 30% of the world's population, uh, 2.3 billion people and covers 30% of the world's total economic output. But in terms of what the RCEP actually includes, it's relatively conservative, and the question that this um, section started with was to what extent is the RCEP a state-of-the-art deal? Um, and in that respect, it falls short on almost every criteria. 
uh, it's essentially an agreement that reduces tariffs between the 15 countries that are the signatories. But this is in a region that already is crisscrossed by lots of different free trade agreements and investment agreements, and in which tariffs are already typically very low. Uh, the RCEP has just 20 chapters um, compared to 30 in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement and 34 in the US-Mexico-Canada Agreement. So based on this, I think it's worth asking why the RCEP exists. And there are obviously diplomatic reasons why the RCEP signatories have formed this trading block. Um, and I think the development of the RCEP should be understood in uh, the context of President Obama's efforts via the Trans-Pacific Partnership to strengthen the USA's economic standing in East Asia. And perhaps the RCEP was in some ways a uh, diplomatic or geopolitical response to that. But beyond those kind of diplomatic questions, it seems that the RCEP is driven by the interests of corporations. Uh, its aim is to make life as easy as possible for corporations that are operating across the region. And it does this by, as Tarane already said, creating a permissive business environment. So lowering the tariffs that need to be paid, lowering the standards that need to be met, and keeping the regulations that businesses need to follow as low as possible. So you can see why, given all this, businesses have welcomed the introduction of the RCEP. But then for the rest of us, there is a note of real caution. This is overall a recipe for deregulation and means that governments themselves have less flexibility when it comes to regulating in the public interest. So perhaps nationalizing certain sectors, driving up standards, or protecting certain industries from international competition. All of this becomes a lot more difficult if a country is a signatory to the RCEP. And therefore, the agreement, in my view, privileges corporate interests above the needs of workers and communities, and is, in some senses, quite anti-democratic. In addition uh, to these points, I think that um, it's notable that the RCEP fails to place any additional responsibilities on businesses to, uh, to counterbalance the rights and opportunities that it provides. So the RCEP is notable compared to other similar trade agreements in that it fails to play any lip service to human rights and the environment in terms of its language. And Tarane already mentioned this. Uh, often similar trade agreements include language about human rights and labor rights, about the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, or even around the Paris Climate Agreement. And in this really important respect, the RCEP fails to do any of this and therefore cannot at all be seen as a, as a state of the art or best in class agreement. Um, and I'll go a, a bit more into uh, this uh, shortcoming in depth later in the discussion. Thank you. Yes, please, Tom, feel free to do so. Um, I mean, uh, thanks for sharing your um, thoughts on, on this. And uh, Natasha, can you please provide some thoughts on, on this topic? Um, and I guess in particular in relation to the impact on the supply chain or the potential impact on the supply chain at the local le level in sectors such as agriculture and, and farming. And I know you, you do have um, on-ground expertise in, in Malaysia, so thank you. Um, I think one of the key um, elements here is to consider how individual businesses could be involved, um, perhaps building on the new human rights-based due diligence requirements and frameworks that um, are out there now uh, to look at that in terms of how they enter into contracts and into cooperation. Um, I think the important thing is for businesses to be aware of uh, the requirements and it, um, especially on the labor side in terms of employment, um, worker rights and human rights impact of businesses. Um, that connection needs to be there and that awareness needs to be built amongst companies as well. Thanks for your thoughts, N N Natasha. And Fr Francis, uh, Tom was mentioning the, um, the big focus of the agreement around um, uh, the private um, sector. Uh, so what will it take uh, to the agreement to stimulate a social compact um, be between other bodies like um, governments, um, social partners, 
and civil society uh, to achieve inclusive and sustainable economic uh, growth and therefore uh, decent work within the region. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. As already explained by you, Ivan, uh, the RCEP covers most economic aspects with uh, very wide and significant social and health impacts. And in this regard, we have very negative uh, view on this RCEP. So I would like to share some, de I mean, the deficit in the RCEP to achieve inclusive and sustainable economic growth and decent work. So I may need to echo what Paul already explained. First of all, uh, I want to highlight these eight years of a series of un undemocratic or least democratic and closed negotiation, which even failed to meet its own principle and objective of our set countries to create an open, inclusive and rules-based trade system to make trade work whole. We, don't, we, feel, we strongly believe that they failed to meet their own principle. And also RCEP as it is today does not accommodate our long-standing demand to establish meaningful consultation mechanism, including social dialogue at all levels, ensuring transparency and inclusiveness. Furthermore, there's, there was no comprehensive impact assessment of the deal and no consideration of necessary mitigation and remedial measures for workers and farmers affected very uh, significantly by this RCEP. And also RCEP does not have any labor chapter, including a provision on labor rights. We should note that the continued and rampant violation of labor rights in Asia and Pacific with a large number of informal and precarious workers and persistent downward pressure on wages and deterioration of working conditions. According to the ITUC Global Rights Index 2020, 10 out of 14, 14 signatory countries of RCEP have no guarantee of rights or with systematic violation of rights. We also know the very serious situation in Myanmar today. Furthermore, the RCEP fails to have environmental standards to ensure environmental sustainability and resilience, despite the fact that Asia and the Pacific is the most affected region in the globe by natural events. And the RCEP does not, have, does not reflect what we have learned from the current COVID-19 pandemic in particular, to respect the government's ability to regulate in the in interest of their people in order to promote quality public services with universal coverage, including health care system. Hence, therefore, the ITUCAP, together with our affiliates from the participating countries, have already called on all democratically elected legislature in the participating countries not to ratify it unless this deficit will be rectified. Considering long and significant economic, social, environmental, and health impacts of the RCEP, it is always not too late to rectify these deficits. Thank you. Thanks, Francis. Uh, really interesting uh, thoughts. And I really like how uh, your narrative is connected to the other um, speakers um, as well. Um, so let's move on. I mean, um, still talking about uh, the same um, issue. And as some of you have highlighted, uh, what related sensitive in issues such as the standards for the protections of um, um, workers' occupational safety and health uh, yet remains um, an issue to be properly covered in uh, public policy agendas on, on this subject. So this debate, um, I can only tell that is um, really uh, is much welcomed. And historically, it, uh, free trade agreements uh, focus on the removal of barriers uh, to trade, as Tom um, has indicated, um, covering social issues uh, like um, occupational safety and health only um, indirectly, if at all. Um, in recent uh, decades, uh, the importance of labor provisions and social clauses um, has been increasingly uh, recognized. Um, for example, our paper confirmed uh, the supporting evidence that highlight uh, how labor obligations, including health and safety obligations, um, are becoming increasingly important elements in this uh, kind of uh, agreements. Uh, for example, in the ones uh, led, as uh, some of the speakers have mentioned, uh, by the US or uh, the European Union, that require the parties to respect uh, decent work principles in accordance with um, international standards. Um, but that said, um, our paper also alerted of not so well-developed uh, practices that 
might compromise the protection of labor rights or then uphold international labor standards. And this is particularly the, the case for those agreements that involve um, challenging uh, regions, um, um, such as the novel uh, bi-regional association agreement between the European Union and Mercosur uh, with countries from the South America uh, region. Um, so, well, question for the speakers is that as regard uh, trade and agreements, uh, the promotion of decent work, the ratification and implementation of core labor standards are an important area of cooperation uh, between uh, the parties involved in this uh, agreement. So, um, would this create a space for the implementation of collaborative initiatives to improve a labor standard and OSH, uh, occupational safety and health at a regional or, or country level. And um, so, Na Natasha, it would be great to have your thoughts on, on this. I know you already provided some tips, but um, um, can you please elaborate a bit more on this? Sure, thank you. Um, it would be ideal if in the pre-ratification stage that international labor and OSH conditions and standards are clearly outlined this would mean that under such agreements, there isn't a race to the bottom or that the competitive competitiveness of companies across countries isn't based on low wages or poor conditions. This would also mean that there's a clear legal framework and guidelines for companies to follow instead of solely relying on voluntary codes of conduct to meet international standards. Um, cooperation on capacity building, monitoring structures and complaints processes would also be important here as well. Um, consultation, I believe, would be key for having good cooperation. How uh, relevant actors and stakeholders are engaged through the process um, of designing the RCEP um, till rat ratification and beyond. Um, and if governments need to amend laws or policies prior to ratification, uh, what would be important to see is how these changes will be communicated to employers, workers and the public. Um, to also look into who will be enforcing the changes and if they are well equipped. For example, if labour inspectors are able to identify labour trafficking, forced labour or child labour, if these uh, international standards can be upheld. So uh, in terms of complaints mechanisms, who can access it? Will groups most impacted by the agreement be made aware of its existence? And what redress functions would be applicable? Uh, also in terms of monitoring mechanisms, um, this is another area where governments and social partners can contribute. But what exactly would these modalities be? And would it be accessible to those non-specialists from industry associations, CSOs, trade unions, um, that would have a wealth to contribute, but traditionally aren't always involved in these types of processes. So um, as others also mentioned, um, we've seen COVID impacts. Um, it would be really important to see that through the RCEP um, that we can handle um, the impacts on workers um, much better than we have been. How can we have collaboration to ensure that workers are better protected? Uh, last year here we've seen um, pressure on workers that have been exposed to health and safety hazards, uh, even in the production of those very essential goods such as personal protective equipment that's needed in this um, pandemic. Uh, workplaces have become infection zones and worker dormitories have become hotspot cluster sites. So I would really like to see us do very much better and I wonder if through these um, agreements that we could have a stronger crisis response. Thanks, Natasha. Um, Francis, can we have your opinion on this considering that ITUC is one of the uh, key uh, or crucial advocates when it comes to international labour standards? Thank you, <clears throat> Ivan. Well, first of all, I would like to highlight that occupational safety and health is a fundamental human and workers' right. Sorry. And uh, that the international instruments clearly declare, including Universal Declaration of Human Rights and International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and ILO instrument. Uh, as, you, as you may know, 
Nearly half of ILO instruments deal either fully or partially concerned with issues related to occupational safety and health. And ILO de centenary declaration for the future of work also re well reflects the importance of the OSH issue. However, 2.78 million people died from work related illness, work related illness and injury each year, even before the pandemic, which means every day uh, seven more than eight, almost 8,000 workers died. Some 30, 374 million non fatal work related injury occur every year, resulting in more than four days of absences from work. Asia is the worst region in terms of work related mortality. 65% of the all work related mortality in the world came from Asia. And you must know that the uh, the economic burden of poor occupational safety and health practices is also quite high, estimated at 4% of the global GDP every year, which, are, which is around 3 trillion US dollars. The COVID-19 pandemic also clearly demonstrates the importance of occupational health and safety measures to contain the virus from the workplace. Unfortunately, with very poor, uh, inadequate uh, uh, OSH measures in, 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 in Asia Pacific countries, a large number of workers, including over 17,000 health and care workers have died from the virus. Uh, we have, uh, ITUC have been working together with ITUC Global to improve the OSH condition in the country, in our region. However, the Asian Pacific region have been facing inadequacy and ineffectiveness of national and local OSH legislation, especially most legislation undermine participation of workers and trade union to deal with these OSH measures. Also, the enforcement, enforcement of the OSH is also of serious concern with a weak regulatory frameworks and monitoring system, inadequate number of labor inspectors, lack of financial resources, and unreliable data and lack of tripartism. I would like to highlight the, the critical role of trade unions to improve OSH based on freedom of association and the right to bargain collectively. Therefore, I believe that all, tra all free trade agreements should realize OSH as the fundamental rights with, of course, an enforceable and effective labor chapter with the robust monitoring mechanism to have positive economic, social, and environmental impact. Thank you. Thanks, Francis. Um, I think that's um, indeed a really interesting, um, um, or sorry, a really important uh, point to be highlighted throughout the, the debate. Um, and Tom, um, you mentioned um, um, similar agreements that we could uh, potentially benchmark in terms of higher standards, uh, especially those coming from uh, the North America region or um, led by the, the European Union. So uh, what are your th uh, thoughts on, on this topic? Yeah, thank you, Ivan. Um, so as has already been mentioned, the RCEP has no commitments within the text to the internationally recognized human rights, labor rights and environmental standards that are defined by the UN or by the ILO. Um, these are included, as you say, in the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is the trade agreement that links a lot of the um, uh, the uh, East Asian and, and South American economies, as well as Mexico and Canada, um, and in some of the EU's free trade agreements since about 2014 that have been signed. But even in these trade agreements, there is little enforceability, and they simply provide via a trade and sustainable development chapter to provide a structure for resolving human rights issues through the framework of the trade agreement. Uh, so for instance, within the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, if it can be proved that a specific company or factory uh, has um, been guilty of labor violations, such as paying below the minimum wage or suppression of unions, then there is a mechanism within the agreement to suspend the trade advantages for that specific company or factory. So putting extra tariffs in or uh, restricting market access. And that is a positive way in which trade agreements can support um, better human rights and labor rights. Although in 
every example, I think there are uh, there is much more progress that needs to be made to understand how that can work more efficiently and effectively. And these processes tend to be very slow. Um, as has already been noted, the RCEP is silent on all of these matters. It contains not even the most um, the most kind of cursory language on human rights commitments, and it doesn't even reference the ASEAN's own human rights commitments. Um, this matters, firstly, because if we are hoping to use trade deals to build a fairer and more prosperous world, then those trade deals should add responsibilities on business as well as advantages to international business. And this also matters because of the specific geopolitical context of the RCEP countries. And two of the most significant issues in the region at the moment when it comes to labour and supply chains are the widespread and well-reported issues of forced labour in Xinjiang in China and in Myanmar, the suppression of trade unions and the imprisonment of union leaders. And it's notable that on both of these issues, the RCEP will be completely toothless. And when you add to that, the huge range of ongoing issues in the region from low pay to the abuse of migrant labor to mass deforestation and in sectors from palm oil to rubber to garments it seems even more ridiculous that the RCEP is so toothless on core labor rights human rights and environmental protections thank you thanks tom uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts um and Darini, um, considering, I mean, the, the role in the agenda of the UNDP, um, what are your thoughts on the, on, um, the implementation of um, co these collaborative initiatives and how uh, those could drive improvement? I mean, even if the, the agreement is still in its ratification stage. Thank you. I think you're on mute, Tarini. Great, Yuan. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. I may have answered this question uh, in the previous question. But again, I think this is uh, going to be a strong driver for the signatory state uh, to uphold their commitment on the promotions of decent work and uh, human rights as a whole to um, based on the international labor standards and conventions and also become an incentive for those members who haven't made the ratifications on the key conventions. If the trade ag agreement have explicitly included the commitment of human rights as part of the prerequisite or the condition associated with liability of the agreement member. But the issue of enforceability is also important that we have to monitor and I think it's also reflect um, by other speakers already. In addition, um, um, on the technical part um, of the trade agreement, uh, we, we have seen that uh, some trade agreement also offered area of collaborations in terms of exchanging expertise and good practices through forum and dialogue. Um, this therefore will, will lead to uh, a, a platform of uh, learning and sharing experience and challenges facing among the, the signing parties. And at the country level, UNDP Thailand had been supporting such a dialogue uh, between the policymakers and also the private sector in the area of human rights. And of course, uh, the issues are related to labor um, are part of the discussions. And uh, the challenges that we found from, from this um, uh, dialogue is the issue of policy coherence, um, uh, meaning that there are still some gaps um, um, between the national law and regulations and the international standards. For example, the gap on the national uh, regulation on ethical recruitment of migrant workers and the provisions um, of freedom of association and collective bargaining as um, reflecting in the ILO conventions 87 and, and, and 98 uh, and so on. And in this regard, we uh, are collaborating with um, other UN agencies uh, like IOM and ILO who have specific mandate on, on these issues to support the, the Thai government and the businesses to address those gaps um, to ensure the, the decent work um, um, conditions, uh, which is the fundamental rights of workers and also the key element for the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Harini. I know the UNDP are leading the way when it comes to collaborative 
um, initiative with like-minded international um, organizations. So um, thanks for raising awareness on, on, on this issue. Um, and as many of the speakers um, are highlighting, it is true that um, uh, free trade agreements can lead to both um, positive aspects, such as increased um, foreign investment or economic growth, but conversely, um, they can also lead to negative aspects, uh, such as poor working conditions or precarization of particular um, sectors. Um, this was, I guess, particularly the case of the North um, American uh, Free Trade Agreement, uh, the so-called NAFTA, uh, signed by Canada, Mexico, and, and the U.S. that led to many manufacturing industries um, closing and allocating the jobs um, to Mexico, where, as uh, many of us uh, know, enforcement of uh, labor or health and safety um, standards or protections uh, were and continue to be uh, more fragmented. It is for that reason that inclusion of um, health and safety uh, regulations within trade agreements need to better protect against these um, issues. So this is a question um, um, really for, for all. Uh, with that in mind, can you please provide some um, uh, further tips or advice on uh, how the so-called uh, least developed um, countries included in the agreement in accordance with their um, regulatory uh, frameworks and circumstances uh, can or might progress towards uh, the effective implementation of uh, human rights uh, due diligence. Um, so, Nat Natasha, um, um, the floor is yours. Uh, can you please share your thoughts? Sure. Um, to start with, uh, it would be important to look at the starting point for each of each country in these areas. That they they will have strengths and weaknesses across sectors and industries that won't be the same in each country. And I think support should be designed accordingly. Um, we also need to see who is currently included and excluded in current national regulatory frameworks. Um, for example, are the most vulnerable workers and communities included in labor and other laws, such as young workers, casual workers, internal or international migrants, refugee and asylum seekers, workers in the informal economy, and so forth. Uh, we would also need to look at the capacity building support provided to such countries, um, as well as business actors, civil society, and trade unions in these countries. Here, resources, tools, and trainings would really be critical, uh, especially along with um, the support for enforcement functions in the government, such as labor inspectors. Uh, from a business perspective, how industry associations are consulted in these countries and included at the table is important to look at as well. Employers may actually be able to move faster than the time that it takes for laws and regulations to be amended. Um, so they do play a vital role in ensuring decent work. So getting them on board, um, using market leverage, especially for those uh, import or export oriented companies is really critical. Um, they do, however, need a mechanism, perhaps via their industry associations or others, to be able to communicate with governments where laws and policies need to be amended so they could uphold decent work conditions um, and also to be able to share the specific support they need, such as the ease of access to information guidelines on the application of complex laws, uh, perhaps tools and resources. Um, from our experience working on the ground in several uh, developing countries um, with farmers and with um, producers of various agricultural produce, what we see is there is a real need for resources, tools, guidelines, support to be able to translate uh, laws into practical application on the ground for employers. Um, and as these least developing, developed countries are often source countries of migrant workers, I believe there is a need for support and cooperation around the recruitment of migrant workers. Um, such cooperation across the region on this topic would ensure that all workers' rights are respected, uh, that there are clear fee structures for employers to pay, 
uh, an end for ne unnecessary bureaucratic processes that then lead to um, in that encourage the use of middlemen, for example, in recruitment. Um, and this can also help um, end recruitment related debt bondage of workers and promote transparency in recruitment processes more broadly. Um, thanks, Natasha. I think those were really practical uh, tips and really good um, advice. Uh, Tarini, um, Natasha mentioned uh, the importance of um, um, making improvements when it comes to training and also uh, to provide uh, practical tools and resources on the on the ground. What, what are the tips or advice can you please um, give give us or give the audience? Thank you, Ivan. I think this is very important question to ensure that every member will really benefit from the trade agreement. At the regional level, a technical collaboration between the member of the agreement is very critical. As mentioned earlier, that UNDP Thailand have been supporting a South to South collaborations through our capacity building, technical support, and also the dialogue between different stakeholders. We are also working closely with the private sector um, to support them um, to conduct the human rights due diligence through trainings and, and through de development. For example, last year we uh, just launched a, a simple tool um, called a rapid self-assessment for business in the COVID of, of COVID, uh, in the context of COVID-19. Um, so they can use this to identify the human rights risks uh, in their operation and supply chains. And the issues of, of labor is also part of, of, of the creation um, that they have to do the assessment. And these are already available in 12 languages. And in this year, we are going to launch a training guide um, for the uh, 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 company to conduct the human rights due diligence um, within their own organizations. And at the national level, I think the collaboration between the government, private sector, and civil society is a key for success especially the role um, of um, civil society, which Natasha um, already mentions. Um, you know, there, there can be a non-profit organization, uh, worker association, or, or the trade union. On the process of the implementations of the due diligence is really highlighted in the UN Guiding Principle on Muslim and Human Rights. Um, they are playing an important role in monitoring the transparency of the process and also, and also ensuring the accountability of the state and the private sector. Therefore, I think it's also important to ensure that the, we will have uh, provided them enough uh, public space for the engagement and be inclusive in, in all the process, um, as this is also a, a, a fundamental and also the principle of the due diligence. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, Francis, we would also like to hear uh, your thoughts on, on tips or, or advice. Um, and, um, both Natasha and Tarini have mentioned um, better, not only better engagement, but more better involvement of the civil society um, organizations. So um, please tell us a bit more. Even um, as, as other speakers already mentioned that uh, many low, many LDCs in the RCEP has been suffering for long from weak labor market institutions with weak or suppressed labor rights and slavery wages, bad working conditions, and so on. Therefore, the development and enforcement adequate national regulatory frameworks and circumstances toward the effective implementation of human rights, social and labor and health and safety due diligence is important. So the ITUCAP together with our affiliates has been advocating it based on social dialogue and we have uh, we have many policy discussions and uh, technical support for affiliate for them to engage with their government to develop an enforcement adequate national regulatory framework so so yeah at the national level i already mentioned the regulatory framework with a strong enforcement mechanism uh, protecting and upholding the labor rights of all workers, regardless of their employment arrangement, should be institutionalized. And such a framework should specifically guarantee the rights of workers to freedom of association and collective bargaining that would allow them to bargain not only with traditional bargaining targets, such as the employer, but also governments and potentially the buyers. As mentioned before, I would like to highlight the 
the critical role of the trade union and workers uh, in improving OSHA conditions. Many studies already show that the work-related injury and disease rates are significantly lower where there is the active trade union presence. Unions have been have to have the capacity and power to make it happen. And this means that recruiting and retaining union members and ensuring our union representatives have the training, knowledge, bargaining skills, support, and strategy in place. So the ITUC together with IPUC AP, we provide necessary materials and uh, the resources for our, our affiliate to improve their capacity. And I would like to share that uh, the, uh, the recognition of the COVID-19 as occupational disease in Philippines is actually after the strong trade union campaign, which demonstrate the importance of the trade union law in improving OSH condition. Thank you. Thanks, Francis. And I, I actively encourage everyone to go through uh, the IDUC website and resources and, and the resources they normally provide uh, within different campaigns because those are um, really practical and, and insightful. And, and Tom, you already mentioned um, um, good practices in terms of uh, you know, let, let's say the, the big countries like uh, um, Canada, the US, or, or even I mean the um, uh, the European Union. But isn't it you know this thing the most challenging thing? You know, uh, the diverse variety of countries that are um, involved within the agreement. You know, from emerging countries, developing countries, or uh, less developed uh, countries. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. Um, and I think uh, I, a comment on the trends towards human rights due diligence laws, the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre that I work for is very supportive of these um, legal innovations and we are supporting various campaigns and um, areas of research in the EU and in Latin America and in the UK um, involved with various campaigns, uh, including uh, other unions and civil society organizations working to try and get these laws through, not because we think that they will be able to solve every problem that we identify in global supply chains and with business practice, but rather because we think they will provide an additional, uh, an additional means through which workers in global supply chains will be able to access justice and access remedy. And the important aspects, as far as we're concerned, of these laws is not that they oblige companies to conduct human rights due diligence, although that's obviously very important, and not that they oblige companies to publish their human rights due diligence assessments, although that is also very important, but that they create a relationship of liability so that companies can be held legally accountable if they fail to uphold and respect human rights standards and that liability relationship has um, I think been all too lacking in the way that businesses have been regulated over the past few decades. I want to make a comment as well about the tariff reduction aspects of the RCEP because I think this is really relevant when we're talking about occupational self safety and health and we're talking about uh, the the standards of uh, labor support in different countries. And the RCEP, as I said at the start, is in its sole a tariff reduction agreement, and it obliges all of the member states to uh, eliminate the customs duties that they impose uh, by approximately 92% over 20 years. So it will be after 20 years much, much more easily, much, much more easy to buy and sell goods across the borders of our set countries. Now that tariff reduction reduces the ability of countries to support and nurture their domestic industries. And I think while that might pro provide some opportunities for cheaper goods, it also provides the structures through which uh, labor and cheap natural resources can be exploited internationally. Obviously the current state of global supply chains is in many places grotesquely unequal and some countries 
have been locked into producer status. So they have low wages, low regulations, and their economies have been designed to churn out cheap goods or churn out cheap natural resources for the consumption of richer countries. And this situation has obviously been partly created by the legacy of colonialism, but it's also been partly created by the uh, trend of these free trade agreements that lock countries into a low regulation approach rather than allowing them the flexibility and policy space to pursue their own development priorities. And no one has yet mentioned the fact that the RCEP was initially uh, negotiated by 16 countries and that uh, midway through last year, India, which had been one of the negotiating parties, decided to drop out. And there were a number of reasons for this, but I understand that part of India's motivation for leaving the deal was that by signing up to the deal and dragging tariffs down, Indian farmers, which are obviously a very significant constituency in that country, would have been additionally exposed to international competition, to being undercut, and that would have undermined livelihoods in the country and pushed those farmers into more precarious and vulnerable work. So the RCEP agreement, by requiring countries to keep tariffs low, denies those countries the ability to industrialize at their own pace and therefore is likely to limit the development of the poorer countries in the RCEP region while potentially creating additional market opportunities for those richer countries. And so for that reason, I see the RCEP exacerbating already existing inequalities within the region. And that is something that we need to tackle if we are to prioritize decent work in the wake of the COVID pandemic that respects labor rights and unions and offer, offers countries the ability to move beyond these very labor intensive, low regulation industries um, that uh, have very, you know, very much associated labor rights issues. Thank you. Thanks, um, Tom, um, for highlighting uh, or, uh, that link between tariffs and, and standards. Um, sorry, just a really quick uh, question. So do, do you also see uh, similarities between um, um, the agreement and the Mercosur, the one affecting uh, those countries from the South America region? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, when you look at different free trade agreements around the world, they have far more in common than they have difference. And the fundamental logic is to remove barriers to trade and while that as i already said provides opportunities for some businesses that also uh, has the effect of reducing the flexibility for governments to support their industries and to bring up standards um, and so uh, agreements that are fundamentally about bringing down barriers to trade and also bringing down standards uh, have a lot in common Thanks, Tom. Um, really, really interesting. Um, so um, we're now getting towards uh, the last theme, uh, proposed theme of our panel session. Um, I'm really enjoying the conversations, uh, to be honest. Um, so our last theme is much about um, anticipating change or future developments. It has already, or it has been previously mentioned that we can expect uh, major uh, long-term trends impacting um, uh, within the whole uh, region, such as the restructuring of global uh, value changes, um, countries or some particular countries embarking themselves in the um, digitalization of their economies or nations becoming uh, strongly aligned to uh, greener goals and jobs, uh, therefore abandoning uh, traditional dangerous um, activities. These are uh, some examples that have been uh, reviewed in the Asia Pacific uh, Trade and Investment Trends uh, 2020, uh, 2021 uh, Outlook Report by the Economic and Social Commission uh, for Asia in the Pacific. So on that basis, um, I'd like to ask our distinguished speakers about uh, the impact of the Sustainable Development Goals and also uh, that link between uh, sustainability and business and human rights. 
Um, I'd like to know uh, what are the major trends that will positively or negatively impact at a, a local or, or global level. And I know uh, we have already mentioned some um, specific sectors such as um, the palm oil um, industry um, and also um, also other challenging sectors that uh, might um, come uh, to an end at a longer term, such as the coal uh, mining um, as well. So, and Natasha, um, based on your ex local expertise in the in the region, um, can you tell us a, a bit more? Thank you. Um, whatever the sector or the industry concerned, uh, we really need to ensure that people are employed in decent work and that their human rights are respected. So, we need to understand what it will take for employers to respect their workforces. And we need to also understand what workers' needs and desires are for their future. Uh, there really needs to be uh, real freedom in choice of employment. So that would mean that work, whether in a rural or urban setting, across um, whatever sector or industry, would all need to have decent working conditions. Um, and these decent conditions should be easily recognizable across countries. Um, and sectors and industries. Uh, I would like to discuss migrant workers here. Um, our Asia Pacific region is a huge exporter of labor within and outside the region. Uh, within countries, internal migration is often a necessity, um, especially to large cities where employment is more freely available. But if we imagine um, these same countries in the region actually being able to achieve um, the SDGs, their companies uh, being able to achieve sustainable business practices and OSH standards. Uh, basically, if wages were at a fair living standard instead of the minimum, where there's good quality education that's accessible to everybody, and decent work was actually available to people in their own countries at their village or town level, what then could we say of um, those current migrants who are overseas or internal migrants, would this entire category of the workforce even exist? Would people still be pursuing these 3D type jobs in future? Um, clearly, standards will have to be raised to attract and retain workers in the long term. So whether we're talking about plantations in Malaysia that are dependent on migrant workers or farms in Australia dependent on holiday and seasonal work visa holders, we really need to think about the future of work in these critical sectors that are dependent on migrants or other vulnerable workers and how this will impact labour, trade and economies in the years to come. Thanks, Natasha. Um, I know you, you probably mentioned uh, the palm oil in industry, and I know there have been also some recent uh, discrepancies uh, from the European Union on this particular sector and how um, the production uh, should be like more sustainable. C can you give us um, um, some further thoughts on anticipating change in this particular sector? Sure. Um, I've been working um, on programs and projects with this industry for the last five years now. And um, honestly, I can say that I've seen immense changes, a lot of change in attitude towards uh, workers' rights in the industry. Um, but of course, change has come slowly. So this is where um, it's really important that there is that collaboration and cooperation and support from government and other actors. What we found working with the palm oil industry is that for a lot of small, medium-sized companies, um, or if you're talking smallholder farmers um, that do have labor-related issues, there's a lack of awareness. And the industry is huge. Um, palm oil counts for 5% of Malaysia's GDP. So it's a very important um, industry, but what support is available for those um, wanting to make change, um, trying to convince uh, boards and so forth in their companies that sustainable practices are needed. There's always the risk that if uh, Western countries are blocking or um, not wanting to purchase palm oil, that it will just be sold to, to other countries 
where there's such a critical need um, for palm oil um, as an essential part of uh, people's diets and um, ability to cook. So uh, it's, a, it's a challenging um, industry to work in, but we are seeing positive changes. Um, we are seeing change on the environmental side, the social side, the labour side. Um, so we, we seek to encourage that. And one of the things we're doing at um, Earthworm Foundation is really pursuing more of a landscape approach now um, and really pursuing uh, multiple actors working together with companies, civil society, um, unions, government, um, local farmers and other actors as well. Um, so it will be interesting to see though, um, as this industry is dependent, a lot of migrant workers, um, where it will go in future. Will the supply of migrants still be available and willing or will conditions need to, to really change for local workers to be more interested in this industry as well? Thanks, Natasha, and um, that's much appreciated. And um, again, I strongly encourage everyone uh, to dive into uh, the foundation uh, website and to see um, good examples and uh, practices um, on this particular sector or um, other sectors um, as well. Um, Tarine, uh, I'd like to ask you the same question and also based on your, on your um, sustainability uh, background as well. Uh, but well, I guess um, you would like to focus the attention on, on the situation in, in Thailand. Can we please have your thoughts? Thanks, Ivan. Uh, first of all, maybe I address the trend globally. As you know, that all countries are progressing toward their commitment for the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goal by 2030. The decent work and economic growth is one of the key elements uh, for this achievement and reflecting it on Goal 8 uh, of the SDGs. This means that the country will have to ensure the effective implementations of the relevant measures to promote the realizations um, of this goal in order to achieve the sustainable development. Apart from uh, this um, uh, sustainable development agenda, we have seen um, an increasing expectations from many stakeholders, especially the trading partners, investor, shareholders, and also a group of buyers that are looking for a commitment and also uh, concrete actions from both government and also business on the protections and promotions of, of human rights. And the trends on the corporate sustainabilities, with focusing on the company accountabilities, on social, uh, on society, environment, and also good governance, is another driver for the private sector to do things beyond uh, the compliance on the minimum laws and regulations in the country where they are operated. In Thailand, many uh, major company. Yeah, I'm talking about the big firms, have been um, um, conducting the human rights due diligence since few years ago um, based on their voluntary basis as part of their sustainability initiatives. And also some of these, of these companies participating in the sustainability benchmarkings and rating, uh, for example, the Dow Jones Sustainability Indices, uh, DJSI, which human rights performance of the company are part of the assessment criteria. So these are the trends uh, that are happening for the Thai company, um, especially uh, those uh, with the high uh, revenue generation and with uh, capital uh, market um, uh, licenses. However, when we talk about the SME, the small and medium-sized company, is another story. It's still a question uh, about how we can bring them into the same page uh, with the big company to ensure their performance on the human rights, uh, respect, and obligations. In addition to these expectations, we also uh, expect to see a more stringent law and regulations relating to the due diligence and the human rights obligations. For example, in the future trade agreement or even some uh, domestic law and regulations. In Thailand, um, we just have a new ESG or sustainability uh, mandatory reporting that being applied uh, to all listed company, regardless the site and the industrial sector. This law was just introduced by the Security and Exchange Commission uh, this year and is going to be in effective by next year. 
the topic on human rights and labor practices are one of the, the mandatory topics that the listed company have to disclose the information about the performance and also the process that they use to manage these issues. So this will uh, strongly have the implications on the corporate human rights um, obligation and responsibility. Thanks, Darren, and um, I'm really interested in the thoughts. Um, Toma, I would like you to go um, next. Um, can you please tell us um, how um, SDGs and decent work in, in, in particular are or, or tend to be embedded in, in trade agreements of this uh, nature? And also, would you like to highlight any trend that you think might positively or negatively impact within um, uh, the partnership? Thank you. Yeah, of course. And you know, my comments will be general and I'm glad that the other panelists are able to provide more specific comments uh, to the region. I think one trend that needs to be watched very closely is around investment protection. Uh, there is a commitment within the RCEP to look at uh, introducing more comprehensive investor protections after three years. And that could include uh, what has been called ISDS clauses, which stands for Investor State Dispute Settlement Clauses. And these clauses in, are included in, in hundreds of trade agreements and investment agreements around the world. And they exist to allow corporations to sue countries if those countries have pursued a policy that makes it more difficult for the corporation to profit. And the most famous example of this was when um, Philip Morris, the global tobacco giant, sued Australia when Australia introduced a law that required uh, cigarette packets to be sold with plain packaging. And Philip Morris said that that law was um, jeopardizing their ability to profit and they sued Australia. And there are lots of other examples. Uh, for instance, um, the Australian mining company Newcrest uh, sued Indonesia when they banned open pit mining that was damaging um, the environment and polluting water sources in that country. Uh, so at the moment, we're very glad to say that the RCEP agreement does not include these clauses, but we need to be very vigilant that in three years time, there is a, an opportunity to review that. And in my view, it would be disastrous um, for all kinds of human rights, environmental and democratic reasons if these clauses were to be involved in the future. I think the other thing to say about the next year or two with the RCEP is that we're all speaking about it as if it is a deal that is already in force. Uh, as you said in your opening comments, even uh, the 15 countries signed late last year, but only four countries have so far gone through the ratification process, and that is China, Japan, Thailand and Singapore. And that provides an opportunity for the other governments uh, who've signed to give their ratification a little bit more consideration. And for the eight years up to last November, all of these negotiations were going on in secret. And it's only since the agreement was signed that populations, unions, civil society organizations and businesses have had the opportunity to actually see what was in the agreement and to give proper consideration to the impacts that that deal might have on workers in supply chains, on the environment, on occupational safety and health. And so I would hope that the coming year or two provides all of those countries with a little bit more time and flexibility to properly consider at a democratic level what RCEP membership would mean for them. And some, such as India already have, may consider not joining because it's actually perhaps not in their overall long-term development interests. So I um, will be watching those ratification processes with great interest. Uh, thanks, uh, Tom. And, I mean, it's been great to have uh, that mix between uh, lo uh, local and global views. Uh, Francis, um, I think you, you are the last one to close this um, theme. So please, can we have your thoughts more from a um, global uh, perspective? Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Um, my, my comments are my answer is quite uh, similar with other panelists. Uh, the future invest, but I would like to change the question to what should the future investment and trade in the region become? 
because the current uh, current governance actually is uh, it actually deteriorate uh, the inequality across countries, and it it's, it especially the low de uh, low developing developing countries suffering from this uh, a, a system a, a symmetric uh, power in the global supply chain. So the future investment and trade should respect international, of course, international commitment, including sustainable development goals and UN guiding principles on business and human rights and OECD, OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises and also ILO multinational enterprise declaration and Paris Agreement, to name a few. In fact, this, these instruments are all interlinked to decent work, supported by creation of decent jobs, workers' rights, social protection, and social dialogue. In particular, the current COVID-19 pandemic uh, makes SDG's uh, Sustainable Development Goal 8 on decent work more relevant than ever, emphasizing the importance of occupational safety and health, protecting jobs and workers' rights, and strengthening social protection system and addressing unemployment and in informality shocks. And this interlinkage between SDG 8 and the other SDGs are, are numerous and significant. And I also want to share you know, the importance of social dialogue in the setup of this arrangement for future investment trade. We must guarantee that all uh, stakeholders should participate, should participate in the discussion to design and implement, monitor and evaluate this, uh, the arrangement for future investment and trade. Uh, last but not least, I would like to share the, you know, this uh, recommendation in, uh, during, on SDG 8 during the Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. And during, uh, after the discussion, they recommend to be, to be more inclusive in the setting and strengthening the institutional mechanism for decent work. Uh, decent work that sustain inclusive and sustainable economic growth and also to strengthen labor market institutions for effective and inclusive labor market governance. And also the accelerate, to accelerate occupational safety and health as a fundamental labor right, and to set up investment in human cap capital to provide all people the opportunities to realize their full potential throughout the life cycle, to progressive, to make a progressive policy reform through social dialogue and including the just transition toward environmentally sustainable economies and societies for all, and to design coherent and integrated strategies to ensure the dignity of work for all, including for informal workers and those in precarious employment, of course, including migrant workers, and to develop and implement frameworks to recognize, reduce, and redistribute unpaid and un underpaid care work, advance equal pay, and enhance public investment in care infrastructure. So I think this future investment and trade should respect those I mean, these uh, recommendations to ensure the inclusive and sustainable development. Thank you. Thanks, Francis, for your final um, thoughts. Um, Thanks everyone for a really interesting uh, debate. So um, time for us now to address some pressing questions coming from the live stream uh, platform or from the participants attending the, the session. Um, let's see if we can respond to these ones in um, just one minute or, or so, if possible. Uh, one sector that has not be, been mentioned during the discussions um, is the one in relation to the consumer electronics and computer manufacturing industry. Uh, that have stimulated growth in the region for the past few years. Uh, what are your thoughts on this sector? Um, anyone would like to address this um, question in relation to the uh, consumer electronics industry? Francis, maybe this is one for, for you to address. Sorry, uh, could, could, you, could you repeat the question, Kate? Sure, yes. Um, one sector that has not been mentioned during the discussions is the one in relation to the consumer electronics or computer manufacturing industry uh, that have a stimulated growth in the region for the past few years. What are your thoughts on this sector, I guess, in terms of standards? Um, 
on this particular sector? Thank you. Uh, we see, of course, definitely this uh, sector is uh, one of the, the leading sector uh, to, uh, for economic growth in our region, the Asia Pacific. But we must understand that there is a very uh, the wide spectrum of the supply chains, and the lower part of these spectrums are, I mean, workers in the lower part of the supply low, uh, the lower part of this uh, spectrum in the supply chain have not been given full respect of their rights. And they are suffering from very low wage, low living wage. Uh, and also their the fundamental right, especially the freedom of association and the right collective uh, right to the right right to collective bargaining are uh, 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 suppressed or violated. So I, I mean, my my answer, my my comments uh, during this uh, panel discussion is also, you know, the relevant to this sector. I mean, uh, we must have uh, must have uh, we must uh, set up, you know, the regulatory framework uh, to 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 make you know these all workers, regardless of their their status of employment enjoy their, their fundamental workers' right to represent their, Thank you. their interest. Thank you. Th thanks, Francis. Um, um, and then we do have another couple of questions that I'm, I might have to merge into, into one, and that could also act as a conclusion. So if you, um, around the table, if you can just uh, provide one key takeaway uh, response, that would be great. Um, how can civil society organizations uh, be better represented in trade agreements, um, discussions, and negotiations. Um, so, um, Natasha, okay, can you please give us a, a quick highlight on, on this, a quick takeaway, sorry. You, you're on mute, sorry. I think monitoring of the trade agreements is an area for civil society participation. And as we discussed before, even um, in the design of the trade agreement, uh, civil society's perspectives can be included at this stage. Um, and civil society is very broad. It also includes industry associations and um, you know workers associations and so forth. So including this variety of perspectives um, in beforehand and then monitoring and later in evaluation would be the best um, so that different perspectives are heard and it's not just coming from um, one sector being government. Thank you. Um, Tarine, can you have um, um, your key highlight? Thank you. Thank you, Iwan. I think this um, role of the civil society is uh, very critical. As I mentioned earlier, um, this is one of the key areas that UNDP Thailand are supporting in terms of the dialogue, uh, providing them enough public space for the engagement. Uh, one of the challenges that we found is that um, the, the civil society organization kind of like cluster, they are doing the work uh, 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 in different interests. Like for example, uh, this one are working on the environmental uh, issue and this one working on the privacy. So uh, the questions um, and the difficulty is how we can bring all of them and consolidate um, their input together and giving them the floor to express their voice and concern. And uh, I agree with Natasha that we have to include them since the process of, of drafting the agreement or deciding whether we will do the trade agreement or not. And their role will be very critical when it comes to the monitoring uh, the effectiveness of, of the implementations of the, the trade agreement. Thank you. Thanks, Tarina. Um... Tom, um, your key takeaway of how civil society organizations can be represented in trade agreements and uh, negotiations. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it's notable even in those trade agreements that do include commitments on human rights or labor rights or, the environment, or environmental standards that those uh, chapters are always secondary to the overriding target of the trade agreement which is to create easier uh, cheaper and more efficient trade and if we are to truly try and ensure that trade agreements do uh, good things for human rights and labor rights and equality then we need to make sure that those human rights provisions are on the same st uh, of the same status 
as the mainstream economic provisions in the trade agreement. And so we need uh, enforceability mechanisms that allow civil society to note where there are human rights abuses between partners in trade agreements. And we need the uh, sanctioning and enforcement to be at, at the same standard as it is if, for instance, a party to a trade agreement had put in new tariffs or put in new regulations. When that happens, there are lots of ways that those can be challenged. When human rights abuses are alleged, then there's far less enforcement. And so you know, the RCEP agreement is, is way below this, but even the ones that we talk about as, as the best in class are still dominated by the overall idea that they're trying to make trade easier rather than also trying to support the realization of global human rights. Um, and finally, Francis, your key takeaway in one minute, please. I just want to reiterate that uh, the RCEP uh, itself actually failed to fail to have a people and labor and our planet at the center of this. Uh, I mean, they failed to address the people, labor, and our planet that should be at the center of the building, prepare us a future with the sustainability and more inclusiveness and resilience. So our demand is very clear that uh, we want to uh, rectify th those uh, deficits, which I already mentioned earlier, for towards an open and inclusive and rule basis trading system for all, including the, yeah, for all people, including all workers, regardless their status of employment. And also the, regarding the OSA, or the OSH, Occupation and Safety and Health. As you know that the ILO governing body in March this year, they, they decided to include this discussion to discussion of, uh, about inclusion of the safety and health as a fundamental right at work. And we, we see that governments are very supportive and many major employers are also very supportive. ITUC AP and ITUC together with our affiliate continue to, I will continue to work to make this support translated into formal acceptance of occupational safety and health as a fundamental rights at work at the International Labour Conference in June 2022. So I also uh, would like to uh, ask you of your continued support to, to give priority to occupational safety and health. Thank you very much. Thanks, Francis. We're also eager to see that uh, development coming into fruition uh, in the next ILO um, um, conference, international conference. Um, well, special thanks to, to the speakers. You, you've been um, such a great uh, panel and the organizations you all represent for the great work uh, they do on the ground and at a more uh, global level. Um, we also are uh, really grateful to the participants that have joined us uh, today and to the translators that are getting our message across in uh, 12 Asian languages. I'm sure the resource will also be uh, made soon available on demand for later uh, view. So feel, uh, please feel free to come back to us with any further uh, questions or comments. And well, and, and Please enjoy uh, the rest of the four days of thought leadership uh, content and, and stimulated uh, discussions. Uh, again, thanks and please stay safe, everyone. Thank you.